So, so far we have looked at this field of study called gain theory which looks at rational behavior in multi agent scenarios. Then we looked at a host of popular games and got some history about which games are played well by machines and which are not played well by machines. In the subsequent lecture, we will focus on simpler games. These are called board games and we will see how they are modeled as game trees and what are the algorithms used for playing these games. So, board games are essentially two person games in the sense that they are played between two players. So, chess is an example, checkers, go, all the humble cross and knots which children play. All these are examples of board games in which there are two people involved. These are zero sum games where one side wins and the other side loses. The total payoff as we have studied in zero sum games is zero or the game can end in a draw which is and they get zero points for that and as we will see shortly. These are complete information games where both players can see the board position completely and they can see the moves available to the opponent as well. So, they know exactly what the other person can do and take that into account in their own strategy formation. These are typically alternate move games where each player makes a move turn by turn. Though under certain con conditions one player may be allowed more than one move or what can be called as a compound move. So, if you have played the game of checkers you know that you can capture two coins at one time or if you have looked at reversi or othello also as it is called then if the opponent does not have a move you get a uh, second move. But typically they are alternate move games that you that you play a move I play a move and so on. And they are deterministic games there is no element of chance of any kind involved in this. So, as you can see that they are the simplest kind of games that we can consider, but in this small set are games like chess and go which have fascinated us for uh, centuries together. It does not include games like backgammon which is a throw, throw of dice or card games like poker and bridge or games like scrabble where there is an element of chance as to you know which, which letters you get and you do not know what the opponent is opening. These are much simpler games two person zero sum complete information alternate move deterministic games. So, let us see how to tackle such games. Once you know the rules of a game then you can construct a corresponding tree which is called a game tree. In this tree there are two players involved remember it is a two person game and the two players are signified by different ways of drawing the node and uh, it is a layer tree in which we always look at the game from Max's perspective. The one player is called Max, the other player is called Min. Typically, we draw the Max as a square and Min as a circle and it is a layer tree in the sense that at the first level Max has to make a choice then based on the choices of Max at the second layer Min makes a choice then based on the choice of min at the third layer max again makes a choice and so on and so forth. And all the games that are possible are represented as paths in this game tree. So, max and min choose alternately max makes the first move min the second and so on. We always see the game tree from the perspective of max because if you imagine that we are going to write a program for max the leaves of the game trees are labeled with the outcome of the tree. So, once a game has ended you know what has happened. Uh, so, W stands as a win for max and loss for min. So, for example, uh, here is a leaf which is labeled W which means that if the game that is played is as follows. then max would have won the game. The, the label W stands for win and the win is for max. 
L stands for a win for min and a loss for max. So, if, if we had ended up in a leaf node which is labeled L, that would mean that min has won the game. And we have the third outcome possible which is for example, here which is draw D stands for a draw which means neither side has won essentially. So, to kind of quantify the payoffs, we can sometimes label them with plus 1 for max minus 1 for min and 0 for a draw. So, you can see that the total payoff is if one of the side wins it is plus 1 and minus 1 for each player you have to add them up and if neither side wins then it is a draw they both they get 0 points. You can also see why max is called max because max is trying to reach the score of plus 1 which is the maximum of the 3 possible outcomes and min is called min because min is trying to choose the smallest value in the game which is minus 1. Now, what happens when a game like this is played? Now, remember that we have said that we are concerned with rationality here that we assume that both the players are perfectly rational, they are perfectly able to think about the consequences of their actions, they can look ahead and analyze the complete game tree. So, given a board game like this, we can determine what is the Nash equilibrium for this particular game and which is when both the players play perfectly. So, as we said the leaves are labeled with the outcome of the game. When both players are rational, the value of the game becomes fixed because both players make the best move at every stage. Th that value is known as the minimax value, it is the outcome when both the players play perfectly. And the minimax value of a game or a game tree can be computed by applying the minimax rule in a bottom up fashion, which means you start from the leaves and you go up towards the root of the game tree. The minimax rule is as follows that if j the node that you are looking at is a max node, then backup values from its children as follows that if a w node is available, you back it up or plus 1 as the case may be. If w is not available, you back up 0 or d else you back up l or minus 1, which means that if there is a move in which max can win, max will make that move and therefore, the value of that game will be w. Otherwise, max will make a move in which the game becomes a draw. So, the value of that node j will become 0 backed up value. Otherwise, there is no option but to lose the game. Likewise, for min you back up in the reverse order that if, if you are a min node, if you are looking at if j is a min node, then from the children of j you back up l if possible. Remember l is a loss for max and a win for min and min is also trying to win the game. So, L also corresponds to minus 1 that we said and that is why we said that min player is called so because it chooses the minimum value which is minus 1 in this case. If it cannot get a value of minus 1, it will also like max settle for a draw. So, the second choice is always 0 or draw for both the players. And the third choice is to lose the game, in which case it will have to back up a value of w, which is a win for max, but a loss for this. Game. So, at each layer we can do this backup of values and once you do this, we will get the minimax value of the game tree. So, let us see this process on the small game tree that we have constructed. Now, remember that the game tree encapsulates all the rules of the game. You have constructed the game tree by looking at the game rules and deciding what are the moves for max and what are the moves for min. We have not labeled the moves in, in our game tree, but you can imagine that each move has a label. For example, pawn to king 4 or place a cross at a particular square in cross and knots whatever the case may be. But eventually we have a game tree where there are a set of choices available, it is a layer tree and now we are trying to find out what is the minimax value of the game tree 
and we will do that by applying this backup rule in a bottom up fashion. We will start with the leaves and move up towards the root of the game tree and having done that we will know that if both the players play perfectly what is the outcome of the game. So, let us look at this for the small game tree that we constructed. As we said we will start doing this process in the from the bottom up fashion. So, if you see this node at the lowest the lowest internal node that we can find it has two choices one is plus one and the other is zero. Now, clearly this is a min node it will choose the minimum of the two values. So, it will choose a value of zero. Its sibling has two choices which is minus one and zero. So, it will choose minus one and in this fashion we will back up the values and eventually all the nodes will get a value. So, max chooses the maximum child value and min chooses the minimum child value and this is the process that we are seeing now. First the nodes at the lowest layer the internal are being backed up and then once they have their values their values are backed up to the next higher layer and so on. Exactly. So, you can see that at each stage min is choosing the minimum of all possible values and max is choosing the maximum of all possible values. Sometimes as you can see min is forced to choose plus 1 which is a win for max and that happens uh, for example, here when all the children of that particular min node are labeled as plus 1. So, it has no choice but to back up a plus 1. So, this small game tree that we constructed somewhat random tree is such that if both the players play perfectly then max will win the game essentially. Obviously, if, 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 if a game tree was so small and you could analyze it completely it would be no fun to play the game because you are assuming that both the players are perfect, but as we will see most games are not so small and so they are not so easy to analyze which is why games like chess and go still fascinate us. But a game like tic tac toe or cross and knots which you might remember is a game which is played on a 3 by 3 square and essentially it involves placing a cross or placing a knot and then placing a cross and a knot and so on and so forth. Now, those of you who have had the chance of playing this game in your childhood you would know that the value of this game is 0, which means that if your opponent is playing well, if both the players are playing perfectly then the game will always end in a draw, which is why as you grow older you lose interest in the game because you know that there is nothing much which can be done, but that is not the case for chess as we will see. You could have used the nomenclature of uh, the three labels win uh, or draw or loss W, D or L. So, Max's first choice is W, if not W then D, else L and likewise Min's first choice is L if not D L sub 2. So, this tree that we are looking at now it is just re labeled you could have just uh, substituted minus 1 with L 0 with D and plus 1 with W and you would have got the same tree. But very often as human beings we like to look at the words like win draw loss and because that is how we think of in terms of the game, but the two notations are equivalent as we move forward. Uh, we will see that we will divide we will have a tendency to move towards the numerical notation for reasons that we will see uh, which will become clear as we go along. Now, there is a notion called strategy. Remember that when we talked about game theory we said what is the strategy for each player it is the rational choice that you can make. Now, games that we talked of like prisoners dilemma they were you have to make only one move. So, you have to simply have a device of whether you will betray your partner in crime or whether you would cooperate with the prison. So, you have to make only one move, but in multiplayer games you have to make a sequence of moves you make a uh, you make 
you make a in a, in a multi move game you make a move then opponent makes a move then you make a move and then opponent makes a move and so on. So, in such a scenario what is the strategy? So, we define a strategy for a player as a subtree of the game tree such that it completely specifies the choices for that particular player. So, once I have looked at the game and say in this board position this is a move I will make then you are freezing your choices, but because you do not know what the opponent will do, you cannot decide for the opponent. So, you have to consider all possible choices for the opponent. So, this is how a strategy is constructed and we are again going to look at it from the perspective of max, because we imagine we are writing a program which will start playing the game. So, here is a small program for constructing a strategy for max you start traversing the game tree starting at the root, go down level by level. If it is a max node that you are looking at or if it is a max level then choose one branch below it. If it is a min node you are looking at, if it is a min level then you choose all the branches below it and then finally, you return the subtree that is constructed. Now, this represents one strategy for max. Likewise, you can make many choices. So, remember that when you are choosing one branch at any node, then you have a choice point and this is the place where max has to decide as to which move to make. So, max will have a set of strategies corresponding to any game tree. So, here is a example of our game tree. We have two strategies. Uh, for max one is let us call it a red strategy and let us call the other a green strategy. Remember that strategies are subtrees of the game tree. So, what you see is a complete game tree and what you see in red is a subtree and what you see in green is another subtree. So, these are two different possible strategies for max. Obviously, there can be other strategies at, as well at every place that we chose a uh, uh, move for max for example, this one uh, you could have chose a different move and that would be a different strategy. Now, what, what do these two strategies, these two strategies uh, achieve for max? You can see that these are the leaves in the two strategies which are colored and in the case of the green strategy because now the choices are left to min. Remember that max has frozen max's choices and the game will be decided by what min does. So, clearly if you look at the green subtree, it has two kinds of nodes either a win for max or a draw for both of them. There is no L label leaf here and so the best that min can do in this strategy if max were to choose the green strategy it would drive the game towards a draw. So, if max makes this move then min can make this move to take the game to a draw or min can also make this move which will in which max has said he will make this move and then min can again drive it to a draw and likewise for the third node which is at the bottom here essentially. So, clearly min will not drive the game towards a node label w, because min is also trying to do the best. In this particular if max is said that this is my strategy, then min can say ok I will accept a draw from you. On the other hand the red strategy has all the leaves which are labeled with w essentially. So, min has no choice, but to lose the game and we saw when we analyze this particular game tree that the minimax value of this game tree was plus 1 or it was a win for max and max can achieve that by choosing a winning strategy. A winning strategy is a strategy in which all the leaves are labeled with w for max. So, ideally 
the task of Max is to analyze the game tree and come up with a winning strategy. Hmm? And we will focus a little bit on this, especially for game trees which are much larger than this particular small game tree. Now, if both the players have chosen the strategy, remember min can also choose a strategy likewise. In a strategy for min, you would make one choice for min node and all choices for max node. So, min can also analyze this particular game tree and say that this is my strategy. So, let us say now the red subtree is a strategy for min. So, the red strategy is for min, which means so there is a there is a common edge between so the green strategy is the strategy for max, the red strategy is the strategy for min. And the intersection of these two strategies is going to be a path which is depicted uh, by double lines in this tree. And this path, which is the intersection of the two strategies, is the game that will actually be played if both the players have frozen their strategy. So, remember that the red subtree is a strategy by min, the green subtree is a strategy by max and this path that we have shown is the intersection of the two strategies. These are the edges which are common to both the strategies. So, once the two players have frozen the strategies, we know what is the game that will be played and what will be the outcome of the game as well. Now, let us have a brief look at complexity of games and when we say complexity of games, we mean the size of the game tree. Of course, this is complexity not in terms of uh, the order notation that we use in computer science very often, where the complexity is in terms of some parameter uh, like the size of a matrix for example. But here the, the size of the game is fixed in the sense that the board is fixed. We simply want to have a estimate of what is the size of the game tree and this is what we mean by complexity of a game. So, the simplest possible game is tic tac toe or cross and knots that we have seen a little while before. Uh, you know that the first player has 9 moves, you can place a cross in any of the 9 squares and then the second player would have 8 moves and so on. So, we are not kind of taking care of symmetries which may or may not be easy to handle in a program. But in the worst case, you can say that the first player has 9 choices. In practice, if you take into account symmetries, the first player will have only 3 choices, either a corner or the center or a side. But then we want to simplify matters. So, we say the first player has 9 choices, second player has 8 choices and so on. And the total possible games will be 9 factorial, which as we have discussed, we already know that always ends in a draw when both the players are playing perfectly. But let us look at the game of chess. Now, the branching factor of chess is also variable. So, if you know the first player white in the case of chess can make 20 moves, uh, it can make 8 pawn moves moving them forward 1 step, another 8 pawn moves moving them forward 2 steps that is 16 and it can move each of the knight. Uh, forward and left and forward and right. So, that is 4 moves. So, the total moves are 20. Any program which searches the entire tree will have to consider all possible 20 moves. So, human players do not tend to do that you know. We always go through a process of learning in which we figure out that certain openings are good and in fact, there are books available on chess like modern chess openings which tell you what are the different kinds of openings that have been used by good players. But as 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 the game progresses the 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 board opens up because as pawns move forward the pieces behind them for example, the queen or the rook or the bishop they become more mobile and the number of moves becomes larger and larger and it increases towards what is called as the middle game. Then towards the end game when the number of pieces start declining because many captures are taking place, the number of branching factor again goes down a little bit. It has been estimated 
that on the average the branching factor in the game of chess is 30, 35. Uh, so, on the average there are 35 choices that a player can make and typically a game is 50 moves long essentially. So, if you take these average numbers then you can imagine that there are 35 ways to 50 possible um, games and which translates to 10 ways to 120 possible games. Now, this 10 ways to 120 is a number that we cannot even begin to comprehend essentially. If you just think of the fact that the number of fundamental particles in the entire universe is estimated to be 10 raised to 70 or 10 raised to 80 or something and each if each of these fundamental particles was a supercomputer looking at whatever you want 10 billion moves a second, 10 trillion moves a second, you can see that there would still be a factor of 10 raised to 30, 40 remaining and that would translate into millions and millions and millions of centuries. So, clearly we cannot analyze the full chess tree and therefore, we do not know what is the value of a chess game which means that we do not know whether if both the players are playing perfectly whether white will always win or whether the game will always be a draw or whether black will always win uh, and that is why chess is still a fascinating game for us uh, unlike tic tac toe or cross and knots which we know will always be a draw. Now, we know that uh, chess has been it is not been solved in the sense we do not know the value of the game, but we have programs which are good enough to play to beat the best humans and that started off in 1997 when IBM's deep blue program beat the world champion Gary Kasparov essentially. Now, the next board game which for many years was considered to be difficult for machines to tackle was Go because Go was played on a 19 by 19 chess board. So, in some sense Go and Tic Tac Toe have a similarity in that in Go if you remember uh, the figure that we had seen, you had to place uh, uh, either a black coin or a white coin on the board and there were 19 by 19 choices in the first place and you can imagine that the size of the branching tree was really humongous and for a long time people thought that go is difficult for uh, computers to beat humans at and people said that go involves a different kind of reasoning which some people associated with zen uh, reasoning where you know you kind of look at the chess board or a go board for a long time and somehow the right move pops up. But as we as history has shown us the program AlphaGo written by DeepMind it did beat the world champion uh, in uh, this is a mistake in 2016. So, Go is also a board game which has been tackled by machines essentially. How do these programs work? As we have just seen, most interesting games they are too huge for to be analyzed completely. The chess tree has about 10 raised to 120 possible games, the Go game has much more, and therefore, you cannot analyze the game completely. So, now we will start focusing on how to write programs to play these games and as we will see these programs will rely on a limited look ahead that you do not look ahead till the end of the game, but only for a few moves ahead and if you do and when you do that you apply what we will call as an evaluation function which is going to be a static function which will look at a board position 
and give it a value basically. So, this will be a value which would signify whether the game is good for player max or whether it is good for player min and so on. And we would use this evaluation function to guide our game playing program. And we will do that in the next session onwards. And we will look at a few algorithms for playing real games. So, see you the next time.